It's great to see you today. Welcome to Living Power, your online Bible study where we are walking through the Bible in a year. Today is April 29th. We are studying 2 Samuel and we are living the life of David during a very difficult time and season in his life. Today we see a battle taking place that none of us would absolutely want for ourselves. We see a battle taking place between father and son, and it is breaking the heart of the father, as we see in scripture today. We're positioned for war. David is the rightful king of Israel. His son Absalom has tried to take the throne. His conspiracy is very plain in front of everyone. He has done a very successful job at taking a lot of the people's loyalty from David toward an, an on himself, and he has quite of a following. He is, he has accepted the plan. Two plans of war were presented before him. He has accepted the plan that included his participation, leading his troops, mobilizing an entire army of Israel, and he, he would lead them in the battlefield. They are going to try to take his father's life, and he is at the crux of this horrendous plan. What we see are that people are taking sides. There is a camp that's loyal to Absalom, and there is a camp that has stayed loyal to David this entire time. Yesterday, we talked about God's sovereignty and how God's sovereignty is allowing all of these events to happen. And we related that yesterday to our own life, recognizing God's sovereignty there. And we said that he is overseeing the outcome. We know from scripture yesterday that God's plan has not diverted from David being the rightful king of Israel. However, he's allowing these events in David's life to mold his character and some of which may actually be the result of some of David's sins. I love it that David gives the command to deal gently with Absalom to his troops. He really has no doubt that his troops, I mean, these are the, uh, the David's mighty men. These are the elite fighting force in Israel. He has no doubt and really shouldn't doubt that they won't be successful in battle today. And in 2 Samuel 18, 5, he gives this command to his troops. And uh, jo, um, Joab, of course, is still the commander of his army. And we've seen him. He is like Rambo on steroids. Joab gets his man and he has no qualms about fighting on the battlefield he sees his target and he does not stop till he goes and gets that target. Joab actually sees Absalom and in God's sovereignty, Absalom gets his long hair caught in a tree. What a bad deal for this guy. Evidently he's riding a, a donkey, I think it is, and the donkey goes under the tree and the Branches get all caught up in his hair, and he's actually ripped from the animal's back, and he's hanging there. He's alive. He's probably struggling, but he can't get free. Man, that's bad. That's, that's pretty bad. So that gives David's men time to see this. God's got him captive, if you will, hanging from the branches of a tree, Bloodthirsty Joab sees him, comes up, and stabs him with three different daggers right through the heart. I mean, whoa, right through the heart. And then ten of the other attendants actually come and strike Absalom to make sure he's dead. It's not a pretty picture at all. David's response when he hears about the death of his son just pierces my heart as I read this because you just can't help but understand the pain of the father that he must have been feeling in 2 Samuel 18 if only I had died instead of you David says about his son you know when Jesus died on the cross 
We can only imagine the emotion that his father, God, felt. You see, God in his holiness could not have not decided that that was the right path for Jesus because God the Father loved us so much that he just couldn't let us stay in our sin. God the Father is so great and mighty and holy that he knew that he was the only one that could provide salvation that was big enough and deep enough and strong enough to save us and to bring us back. So, you see, we see the dichotomy of the decision here. God had to move forward because it was the only way. His love would, his love propelled him forward into this great act. But yet, his love for us also did not withhold his own pain in this whole situation. You know, back in the garden, Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship. They knew Jesus. They walked with Jesus in the garden. It was a time of communal fellowship. Their bodies were glorified bodies. Their bodies were perfect. They would never have died. They would have never gotten sick. They would have never grown old until the time of the apple when they decided to disobey God and when sin entered their lives. That was a huge fall beyond magnanimous proportions that we can't even fully understand. They fell, and then God needed to redeem, and he implemented his plan for salvation. Praise God that he did. But you know, all of this time between the fall and between the time of Jesus' sacrifice, God missed the garden too because he couldn't enjoy fellowship with his creation in the way that he always wanted to and in the way that he intended. Have you ever thought about that? Adam and Eve missed the garden. They were cast out and then they had to toil and they had curses placed upon their life, which was, which was awful. We live in a, a state of sin as well. We understand how we want to get back and drawn back into that time of fellowship. God, however, missed the garden too. And he is patient and long-suffering. And you wonder, well, why doesn't he just make everything right right now, today? Well, because he sees the beginning from the end, and there are people that have yet to be born. And there are people that have yet to acknowledge him and come to saving faith in him. And he doesn't want to lose any of them. And he is waiting for the perfect time, for the time to be fulfilled, for all of those people to either be born or uh, come to a decision in, in Christ so that they can be included also in the body. So maybe it's some of your family members that haven't yet fully embraced Jesus. Maybe it's your great, 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 great grandchildren that haven't yet been born. We just don't know. So we praise God. We thank Him, and we acknowledge Him in His sovereignty, and we praise Him for being long-suffering with us, certainly, and with those that will come after us. So David's response here, if only I had died instead of you, is just a beautiful picture of a love that this father David had for his son Absalom, irregardless of the things that Absalom had done. Now we see some parallels here in the text that I wanted to bring to your attention. I'm pulling these out of some study guides that I'm bringing to you. There is, uh, scholars do see some parallel between Judas and his um, betraying of Jesus, uh, Jesus and his hanging. Remember Judas hung himself from a tree. Ahilophel did the same thing in 2 Samuel 17, 23. So there is somewhat of a parallel here in this story. We also see the role of women. You remember there were women at the tomb preparing Jesus' body for burial. They wanted to anoint him with spices and oils. We saw women at the cross um, being with Jesus in his time of need. And here we see there was a woman from a village east of the Mount of Olives, uh, Olives that actually protected and covered David's messengers from being spotted. So we see the you know 
the um, role of a woman playing a very critical and important part in this story. We also see in 2 Samuel 19.15 something interesting happening. After Absalom is killed and he is, he's out of the way, David now can go home. He can go back to being the rightful king of Israel. What do the people do? Did you notice this? It says, with one accord. When in the world do we have people moving in one accord? This is amazing. With one accord, the people of Judah not only invited David to rule over them, but they sent a delegation to Jordan, to the Jordan River. He is coming back from his place of hiding. He has to cross the Jordan River to get back into, into Jerusalem. But they sent a delegation to the Jordan to meet him and help him cross the river. Look at this parallel. This is a beautiful parallel of two things that I can see that's going to happen in the future. At a future time, it'll be at the Battle of Armageddon. It'll be at a place where it looks like Israel is going to lose the battle and will be annihilated. All of their foes will be there. They will call on the name of Yeshua, of Jesus, and he will come in an instant. And that is what will hearken his second coming. When that happens, all of Israel will be united and they will call on Yeshua, on Jesus. That will be a remarkable event. Another way we can parallel this scripture with a future event is actually something that you and I get to participate in. When Jesus comes back at his second coming, he will, it's, it, Paul tells us in Thessalonians that he will actually the believers that are alive in on the earth at that time when he comes, he will raise, actually physically raise, and we will be elevated to meet him, to greet him in the air. He will also arise the believers, the bodies. He will join the believing bodies with the souls in heaven, and those people will get their bodies back, and they will actually come with Jesus when he comes for his second coming. And there's this picture of this huge delegation of his believers that's coming to meet him and then come back to earth to return. This will, of course, usher in his 1,000-year reign where he is actually king, the rightful king of Israel. But uh, this delegation is a beautiful picture of the delegation that will greet him and that will come with him when he returns at his second coming. You will have a part in that. You'll either be alive on earth and will rise to meet him, or you will have already died, your soul having been with him in heaven, being reunited at that moment with your body, a glorified body which is promised to you as par part of your inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! That is such a wonderful future and picture of this um, greeting and this delegation that we get to be a part in. I'm so excited. I can't wait. Well, let's end on that note today. That's a beautiful picture to take with us today as we go about our work, our comings and goings today. That is your future inheritance, dear one, that you have because you are, you are joined to God as an adopted son or daughter through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord that he has made this possible for us. So as you go praising the Lord today, know how thankful I am for each and every one of you. We thank the Lord for his precious book that we are able to study together. I pray that this uh, day and this lesson has been a blessing to you. Until we meet again tomorrow, blessings to you. Shalom.